of your life. All right, everyone. Um, uh, those of you who have never um, watched a Blaze and Brass Blasters production yet, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this one. This is our first session of our new Dungeons and Dragons 5e campaign. There, I said it. <laughs> We're going to roll the 20 sided dice, which has rarely been done before in Blaze and Blasters, but we're going to show them how to do it. Um, so I hope you stick with us for this journey. We always appreciate it if you leave a comment and if you subscribe and hit the notification button there on your, on your YouTube. Um, so this is our first session of this campaign. Um, as first sessions uh, often go, um, you know, the scene set up is a little bit on the rails, but after that, the goal of uh, this campaign is basically for the GM to wind up the clock on a virtual world and let you guys uh, go, let you guys do whatever uh, you want to do. So we're going to get started. Everybody see that? No. Nope. Right. Easily, easily fixed. <laughs> there we go. Now nah, you should be good. Nope. Not for Feliana. Oh, I yes. got it. Yep. As our tale opens, we see mountains topped with caps of white. We see bleak fields and plains and rolling hills. As we rush over the ground, we come to the Vestberg, a fortress built into a mile-long wall. The Vestberg sits as the gateway to the northern realms in the west of Arcanus. But all is not at peace. As you come closer, you see hundreds, if not thousands, of tents. You spy horses, campfires, and many men building fortifications and preparing for war. Atop the Vestberg's highest tower stands Count Lucas von Severus. His gaze goes out to the miles south and west of his fortress. There, two legions of Conventus troops have amassed. The hammer has not fallen yet, but it will. Maybe in a month, maybe within a year, he has a decision to make. It seems his decision to assassinate the nephew of the legions of the goddess, Aris Romulus, has triggered unforeseen events. Now, the Count must decide to stand alone and weather the legion's siege, or call for help from his rivals in Christenfeld. Or, he could do something more devious. Presently, one of the Count's men ascends the stairway, stairway to the tower. Von Severus turns. What is it? I bring word from the Minister of Spies, says the guard. There still has been no word from the men you sent to Christenfeld, Buzzard's Roost, or Pinebreak. The Count listens and grips the wall, his knuckles turning white as he imagines the force the Conventus legions could bring upon his house. Very well, he says. I will make other plans to deal with the situation. After that, the camera fades into the sky and pans far to the east into harsh and unforgiving mountains. You see a stern keep perched high in the crags, and you see the face of Tarbin Giant's blood, Lord, Lord of Buzzard's Roost. He has received word that a spy has been apprehended and will soon meet the accused in his most favorite of rooms below the keep. Tarbin hears iron-shod footsteps behind him. The offender has been apprehended and shackled. He awaits your interrogation below the keep, my lord. Turning... Tarbin may see the towering form of one of his most trusted knights, 
Sir Carl the Drake. As Tarbin turns to face the man, his normally scowling visage cracks into what could almost be a smile. Excellent. Excellent. I'll see to him myself. Very well, my lord. How would you like the prisoner prepared? I dare say the men below, they, uh, <clears throat> ripened him up a bit. His left eye, uh, doesn't work anymore, my lord. <laughs> That's fine. Just leave him as is. I'll see to him. Very well. And Sir Carl the Drake is a towering brute, but probably not as towering as Tarbin Giant's blood. He gives a salute and a bow and descends the stairs of the keep, leaving Tarbin Giant's blood at the top of the keep, the wind whipping the mountains around him. Uh, describe uh, Tarbin to me, uh, Raven. Uh, give me a little character introduction. Okay. Um, physically, Tarbin is a huge man. Um, standing oh, just over seven feet, uh, maybe seven three. Weighing in at 29 stone, uh, which is about 409 pounds. Uh, bald, but it appears that uh, that's by choice, that perhaps he shaves his head. Um, normally scowling features. Uh, if he did have hair, presumably it would be very dark, almost black, to match the mustache and goatee he wears. And I suppose uh, that covers physically. Um, otherwise, he's really sort of a monstrous, dirty bastard. Well, we'll let your actions speak for themselves, Mr. <laughs> Tarvin Giant's blood. Um, so how does it look as you uh, descend the stairs of the keep and um, go lower, lower, and lower until eventually you reach, reach your favorite room of the castle? And so here we find uh, poor Thomas bound to the rack, a room full of shackles and various implements of, of, uh, of torture and abuse. Ages of uh, dried blood stained the floors to a simple grate where such things can drain. You see a man he's on the rack his left eye you don't you can't tell if it's been plucked out of his skull or simply enucleated it's just a bloody mess running down the side of his left face there's a man who is well corded with muscle but he's wearing a green tunic and he has a blonde beard uh, most of the uh, blonde hair on his head is is matted with blood kind of turns his head to the right as he hears your heavy footsteps descend the stairs. Ah! <laughs> Lord Tarvin! <laughs> ah! I hoped I would get a few more hours respite before you arrived, but ah, just make it quick. Tarvin laughs grimly at that. <laughs> Approaches the man's head, just casually, flippantly, reaches a hand out, presses a thumb into the the damaged eye. <laughs> Nothing quick for you, spy. <laughs> kind of spit something out, and uh, a, a tooth comes up and hits you in the chin. Uh, no doubt, this is what. Uh, Sir Carl the Drake was speaking of when he spoke of quote unquote softening the man up. 
Tarvin seems unduly offended at this. Punches the man in the jaw. You feel his jaw uh, shatter below, beneath your fist. Again, a, a grin plays at the big man's features. What is it to you, was me, Giants? Oh, you'll tell me all you know before this night is over. <laughs> I know quite a bit, Tarvin. I'd say two, three times as much as you. Uh, as they say, muscles are in inverse proportion to the amount of brains in one skull. <laughs> Spits in your face again. Another tooth comes up and hits you in the chin. Tarvin laughs. Pokes his thumb back into the eye. <laughs> Going to be a long night. <laughs> he turns and bellows for a servant to bring him wine. Uh, as you like up the steps, there's a there's a, a, a servant and. She's up there kind of waiting um, her back against the wall. When you're down in this room, like, nobody really wants to come down here. So she hears you, like, bring wine! And it kind of echoes up the steps, and she shudders, and, uh -huh. And she grabs a pitcher of wine, and soon you hear her scurrying feet down the stone steps, and she pours you a goblet, and she disappears uh, back up before she... Uh, uh, my lord, shall I leave the pitcher? Yes! She leaves the picture there for you and lets you get back to your dirty work. Which he does with relish. So, are you just going to sit here and punch me all day, or do you have questions, Giant's Blood? I told you, Spy. You will tell me all you know. Begin at the beginning. Who sent you? Why have you come? Once you roll me a skill check, you can either use intimidation or anything else according to your weapons. With advantage. Um, just as a tutorial, I do have skills set up there in the macro. Okay. So you click on skills and uh, select the appropriate one should have a roll and uh, uh, DC will be 10 and you made it made it and so if you have advantage basically you get to roll twice the entire highest result that you made on the first one uh, Thomas the fails looks at you as he's like oh very well I fancy keeping my right eye kind of spits this time it's away from you, down down at your boots, so it doesn't hit your hit your chin. It's like there's been there's been armies amassing near the Vesper. <coughs> uh, Lord Van Severus tells me there's two Conventus legions, some sort of retaliation. Apparently. <coughs> One of the Conventus legionnaires' nephew knocked up the daughter of the Count, and he didn't fancy that much. Ugh. Ugh. The, the Count is not quite willing to ask for help from Fristenfeld, but as you and I know, the Vesper can only hang out, hold out so long against two legions. So... The Count is probing for weaknesses, Tarbin. <coughs> you need to know anything else because that's it. That's it. Tarbin seems lost in thought for a moment. Looks back down at Thomas. 
And where are these legions now? I do believe they're camped some miles from the Vestberg, making preparations for war. Even with two legions, the Vestberg is... Well, it's quite a fortress. It's going to take months, if not up to a year, to assail the place. But like I said, it's only a matter of time. And without some sort of aid, Count Von Severus is doomed. Tarman nods. Gives the rack a good crank. <laughs> Stomps off to go get word to his liege lords, the Tarasks. So you're going to uh, send them a note. <laughs> yes, the the uh, Arcanus version of the uh, Ravens. <laughs> ha, fun to do. Yes, he'll send a note um, asking them to meet at Pine Break Peak. And he doesn't dare send uh, such sensitive information for their ears only. So the camera fades up from the dungeon where Tarbin Giant's blood scrawls a note and hands it to one of Buzzard's Spruce's many swift messengers. And you that, see that messenger kind of um, running out of the peak or out of the dungeon. And the messenger kind of goes up out of the keep, grabs a cloak, and you see him kind of Descending the stairs into the village below where he grabs a swift horse. And as the camera fades out, you see that swift horse riding up over a bridge down uh, a snowy mountain. And then we're going to, to change scenes. You should see Torquel Tarlson and Dr. Taleb Trundleville here. Is that all right? I see it. Yep. Yep. No technical glitches thus far? <laughs> nope. Excellent. We can't start a proverbial D&D &D game without a tavern. But at least we're going to make this first scene take place in the upstairs part of a tavern. It was like an upstairs private room. Mm -hmm. And there's one uh, Talib, Talib uh, Trundlepill, who's a slenderly built man with a gaunt face and a beard, and rather restless and furtive, but very intelligent eyes. And over the past several weeks, um, he has met, met a man on the road, a rather large man, a man from the north, a man from the frozen wastes of Krupgalanden by the name of Torkel Tarlson. And he has brought Mr. Tarlson into his employ with various jobs. The jobs have ranged from scaring off bandits near a particularly a promising crop of mushrooms in the mountains to more recently um, robbing some graves in the countryside. Uh, no one of note, but uh, Dr. Tilla Trundlehill does uh, no small amount of research on the dead. Indeed, um, as he is often said to say, the dead hold many secrets, and by examining their bones and lifestyles, I'm able to help the living. And so he is upstairs with uh, Mr. Tarlson, and, and they're both enjoying a mug of ale. 
He says, Ah, uh, well, the ale's not much to speak of, but if my sources are correct, Foliana Grendy is, well, she's no slouch. She may be just who we need for this next job, Torkel. Uh, can I count to have you at my side? And I'll let you introduce yourself. Torkel is with you, Dr. Tali. I am at your side, but we need to go big. I want to do great things with my life. Not petty robbery, not small mushrooms. I look to embrace the greater world and do stupendous things and to help you in doing these great things, Doctor. I don't want to smell blood. I want to make blood. It's time that we do something bigger, something stronger. I know that I can count on you to find the greater, greater deeds for us. Ah, uh, very well, Mr. Tar Tarlson. Torkel, son of Tarl. Torkel, we are all equal. Tarkel, very well. Dr. Trundlehill says he takes a mug of ale. Um, looking up at Tarkel, uh, he swallows hard as Adam's apple kind of going up and down. What does uh, Tarkel look like? Yeah, he looks like the great Gnostic people who, who first moved into the the north. Uh, he has raven black hair, absolutely pale skin that looks like it's very seldom seen the light of day. A reasonably good looking fellow, but not very well kept. Kind of rough and tumble looking. Dressed in pelts and skins. Um, not really proper clothing. Dr. Taleb will continue and say, Hey, patience, patience, Tarkel, patience. Every great thing builds starts with small steps. You can't build a fortress without a small brick. You can't build a town without a very small paving stone. So no you patience. keep saying, so you keep saying. Okay, very well, and he slaps a uh, small map on the table and takes another drink of his ale. Right here! This is our big move, Tarkel. Have you ever heard of Elfgar the Old? Should I? No. No. You're not from around here. I'll tell you about Elfgar. Take a drink. This may take a while. Then bring more drink. Uh, Dr. Taleb kind of raises his left hand and sends a server to get more ale. <clears throat> the server leaves a uh, platter of crusty bread and cheese in front of him and uh, then departs. Taleb picks up the cheese and then kind of shoves it towards Torkel. He'll have, he'll have some. Where's the meat? He still eats. <laughs> he just <laughs> kind of rolls his eyes a little bit. Elfgar the Old, back in the over 200 years ago after the Scaveri War, he was the founder of Pine Break Peak. They don't call him Elfgar the Old for nothing, Tarkel. This man, he lived to be nearly 200. That's right. He died not 20 years ago. 200 years old. He knew How something. Do you know? It's not a tale, not a manufactured story. It is not in the nature of nature to work this way. How do you know this is true? He shakes his hand. I'm not saying it's natural, Tarkel. I'm just saying it's true. Look, he kind of brings out his book of lore, and flips through all these pages. I've been doing research for years. Research for years. This is our big payoff. This is where it counts. But, uh, those other graves we've been robbing over the past few months, it stirred up the locals. We might expect a little resistance this time. 
old Elfgar is something of a legend, but we get his body, his bones are going to make us rich. Rich, Tarkel. Great deeds make a man. Money is nice too. Money can buy things, things can lead to fame, fame can lead to great deeds, Tarkel. Talk of the grave robber does not have the ring to it I'm looking for, but we will start here. As you say, start small. Yeah, we gotta start somewhere, Tarkel. And the ale comes, and uh, the uh, serving wench is notorious or obviously void of any meat and just brings the ale. Uh, would it be anything else? No meat? You can certainly bring meat. What would you like? Cow. Pig. Seal. Walrus. And then I will make up my mind what to have second. Well, this is called the reluctant pig, after all. And she kind of points to one of the pictures on the wall that says the name of the establishment, the reluctant pig. It's a picture of a pig roasting on a spit over a fire. Uh, the joke, obviously, being that this pig was quite reluctant of being uh, put on the spit. And so uh, she promises to bring back some savory ribs. But soon after she departs, Dr. Caleb kind of stands up and he moseys over to the rail of the upstairs room. And he looks down uh, at the, the common room of the tavern uh, looking for uh, his most recent quote-unquote hire to enter the establishment. And around this time, around the uh, appointed uh, meeting, um, Foliana Grendy walks into the tavern. And Darren, I'll let you go ahead and pose your entrance. She steps in and <clears throat> takes a very critical look around. She has already an arrogant look about her uh, when she steps in. There's a look of slight disdain or distaste on her face. Uh, she obviously is well-born. She carries herself that way and makes no attempt to disguise it. Um, she's an elf. She's dressed very well, but if you look closely, you can see that the clothes are starting to fade and there are ragged edges around it, some frayed edges. Um, she's a very attractive woman if you are attracted to strong-willed, defiant types. Uh, she takes a step in, looks around, and then immediately she kind of sneers a little bit and starts up the steps. Uh, Taleb just kind of uh, looks at Torkel and says, Yeah, here she comes. Little girl? What we need a little girl for? Great things need no little girl. The door opens. There's no knock. She just kind of shoves the door open with a kind of easy grace and stands in the doorway and says, I was told to meet a pale, sickly-looking man in the upstairs room of this inn. Are you that man? Taylor looks at Torkel and kind of stands, and he's in the middle of eating one of the ribs. It's down the bone and clinks on the plate. Clink. Hastily kind of rubs his greasy hands on his tunic and extends to the grasp. Oh, I suppose I am pale. Uh, not sickly, though, at least uh, not yet. And he extends his hand. Uh, Foliana Gritty, I assume. She just kind of looks at his hand but makes no move to take it. Caleb just kind of takes it and does the old slicks back his hair with his hand and just so happens that the grease from the, from the ribs kind of slicked back his hair a little bit. And uh, he pulls out a chair and says, Would you like to have a seat? We have some ale and meat. 
bread, cheese, if you would like. Foliana looks around the room. Uh, again, her lips curling with a little bit of distaste again. Uh, she doesn't dwell long on Torkel. Uh, clearly, she kind of dismisses him. And you can see her make a big show of of resigning herself to having to take a seat. Um, and she kind of tries to make an attempt to make it look like she's politely eating, but she looks like maybe she's actually a little hungry and uh, eating just a little too greedily. Uh, the good doctor is is no stranger to seeing those who maybe are a little bit slightly undernourished and he gives Fuliana some time and says Miss Greddy there is more where that came from I would hope so so what have I degraded myself to now and she looks up and she sees you're looking at a map Dr. Taylor Trugglehill points his finger at the map, and a, there's a greasy mark right where he puts his forefinger, and it's an old uh, cemetery right along the river here, and um, you can tell it's like just south of town. He says, well, I'm Taylor Trundlehill, if you need an introduction. This is Torkel Tarlson. Uh, this man uh, needs no introduction, as far as I'm aware. He kind of looks at Torquel. I am sorry to feel you, you are being degraded, but you are doing great and important research here into the nature of life itself. And he kind of prattles on a little bit. Foliada may get the idea that uh, Dr. Trundlehill is overselling a little bit. Uh -huh. And he takes a sip of ale and says, We've taken many steps to get here, Fulviana, but your services are needed. Have you ever heard of Elfgar the Old? <laughs> Have I? Um, you can give me a... let's see here. You could do a... History? History, yeah. It's history at 10. There you go. Yep, so you know of Elf, Elfgar the Old, uh, famed... Uh, founder of this town. The town was uh, founded um, first by old soldiers who didn't quite make it home after the Scaveri War. And he was a great leader. Uh, the town has enjoyed many years of peace, has stayed out of big conflicts, but the guy lived almost uh, past 150 years old. She says... I'd be remiss if I didn't know the name of the founder of the town I'm visiting. What does he have to do with this? Dr. Trundle Hill continues and says, Hmm, Torquil, I thought I was just hiring a knife in the dark, but I fear she has a good head on her shoulders as well. Well, explain about starting small. Well, we are looking into Elfgar the Old and feel that his bones may hold a certain secret to a certain elixir that could bring, shall we say, great profit to our enterprise. You see Foliana kind of begin to smile, and she says, So we're to be grave robbers. I would think of it more as researchers. Um, after we're rich, we'll of course return the bones to the grave, um, but they're needed for sampling, grinding, experimenting on. There may not be much left at the bones after we're done, but uh, grave robbers is such a inflammatory word. You said rich. How rich exactly? more than you can think of. <laughs> I'm prepared to pay you for this job at least the hefty sum of uh, 
he takes a coin purse from his pocket and he kind of puts it on the table and moves it around the heavy gold pieces in there seven gold pieces <laughs> is that a lot <laughs> <laughs> What's the, economy of, what's the economy <laughs> here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the equivalent of about a week's salary for uh, like a skilled blacksmith or a skilled artist. Mm -hmm. Foliana says, I can imagine quite a bit more wealth than that. Well, you stick with us after this and there will be quite a bit more wealth, but I'm not going to go paying, you know all my money to an asset that has unproven skills. <laughs> she says, I'm well educated and trained in my craft. You have no need to doubt my skills. Well, it's seven gold pieces for now. Juliana, there'll be more later. Are you in or Come, Foliana the grave robber. This is much money for you. <laughs> How long do I have to think about your offer? You need more time? Ah, this is a steal. Only 20% chance of dying in this mission. Oh, but did I say that now? Make it ten gold pieces and you have a deal. Ten gold pieces? And he brings out, like, three more pieces and slaps them on the table. They chink. And he presses them your way. Ah, very well then. Consider yourself hired. Very well. She reaches out and takes more of the ribs. Of course, the knight's libations and foodstuffs are on me. Is there anything else you would require, Miss Pretty? Perhaps a room for the knight? And he kind of looks at you, kind of... He sensed earlier that you she... may, uh, you know, look wealthy, but you may be in need. She shrugs and she says... Since I'm here, why not? And the scene is going to fade as Dr. Trundle Hill orders more ale, more wine, several assortments of meats, and some bread that may or may not have mold on it. And as he gets up to go to the restroom a little bit later on, he bends over into Tarleson's ear and says, Ha ha! A steal. I was prepared to go to 30. And I need 30. <laughs> and he just shuttles off half drunk to the restroom. All right, Mr. Ghost, your turn. Should be able to see uh, Julius and Sir Tiff in the long. Is that right? I yes. see. Right. Here we go. This is maybe the night before that. And uh, perhaps a week before that, Julius Terrisk in his keep in Christenfeld, Christenfeld has received word from his fathers and his own long, uh, long sworn ally at Buzzard's Roost that things are afoot in the Vesper. Indeed, it seems that uh, Lord Von Severus may have a chink in his armor soon. 
and that the game is afoot to take advantage of this weakness. Um, word has come to you that uh, Tarbin Giant's Blood wants to meet you um, in an abandoned cemetery outside of Pinebreak Peak. Now, you've met with your father, uh, Jarus Tarisk, and he has sent you, Julius, on this task. And he has sent with you um, someone you have known from childhood, but who is still some years older than you, a giant knight by the name of Sir Tiffin of Long. And you are both on great uh, steeds and riding up the road, um, heading in to Pinebreak Peak. Uh, Sir Tiffin the Long has on armor and a crimson cape flows behind him. Um, he has a shield slung over his back that has a uh, closed fist uh, showing the emblem of Fristenfeld. And Sir Tiffin's steed is jet black with uh, some charcoal um, uh, spots over its hind quarters. Uh, Julius Terrace, I'll let you pose yourself in. And uh, be sure to tell me what your horse looks like. Julius Terrace is a younger man, lithe and build, strong in shoulder, gray hair, uh, uncharacteristic for his age, uh, but characteristic for his family. Uh, eyes of a strange hue, pale skinned, um, looks flowing between interested, fears, disinterested. He has on a full black regalia, noble clothing, form-fitting. He rides a white steed, in contrast to Sir Tiffin's jet black horse. He looks over the countryside rather lazily, picking out points of interest here and there to gaze upon. Sir Tiffin's armor just clink, clink, clink as you kind of go through the last part of forest heading into town. Just making, making small talk. He says, I don't know your father's mind, Julius, but if one were so bold, and I know you are, now would be the time to move against those uh, Von Severus snakes. One thing's for certain. The Count has plans within clans. My sword is strong, but I don't urge caution. Use this charm, that charm of yours, Julius, and we'll come out on top. Indeed we shall. Looks around. I have no doubt that my father has planned for this moment for quite some time. Your father is a good man, Julius. And he kind of looks down from his steed where he has a couple hands over Julius. He says, are you a good son? Well, the father's goal is to raise a son better than he, isn't it? <laughs> they always call you the philosopher around the town. You're wise beyond your years, Julius. Point taken. If you make your father proud, I'll be proud as well. I remember you as a little boy, and, well, you've changed quite a bit. And he's making veiled reference to your trip when you were young, and once you discovered your powers, quote unquote, you have changed quite a bit. I will do that to you. One year you're reading books in a library, thinking nothing of what power you have. The next year you're fully engrossed in it, taking travel trips that your father arranges for you to go on. Go meet important people, shake their hands, and tell them how smart they are. Nothing gets past you, Lord Tarisk. I don't pretend to be smart, just strong. <laughs> I 
You do a well enough job of it, Sir Tiffin. Though they call you Sir Tiffin the long and not the philosopher for a reason, I suppose. They call me Sir Tiffin the long for many reasons. <laughs> and as you guys around uh, the last bend, um, you see two shady looking characters kind of um, pressed up against the bridge. They're kind of leaning there. Uh, one of them is like chewing on a, a bit of grass and he takes it out of his mouth and throws it into the stream and it drifts down the stream. And uh, this one's named Jimmy Snorls. And he kind of nudges his buddy there. Hey there. Right there. We've got a couple of live ones coming down the road. Let's go say hi, huh? Yeah, his buddy just kind of looks it over. And Jimmy Snorls kind of Hey there, blokes! Coming into town? What's your business? Julius Terras looks at them. Bold of you to approach me. Are you the watchkeeper for this bridge, or who are you exactly? <laughs> My name's Jimmy Snorls. This is Buddy. Jimmy, uh, uh, comes up to Julius and thinks about extending a hand, but then instead he crosses his arms and says, I suppose you could say we're the gatekeeper of sorts. Uh, we run things around here, me and my buddy, and uh, go ahead and uh, pass on by. It only costs you one gold piece a piece. That'll be two. I'm flat out of drinking money. <laughs> I imagine you might be from the smell of you. And you are wrong about one thing, though, Mr. Snorles. You don't run things around here. That would be my father. And to a certain extent, me. Um, Julius, won't you give me a um, perception check at 10? So you see uh, two more of these guys kind of off the side of the road. And Jimmy Snorl says, I don't know who you are, whelp, but you best quiet your tongue. And he says, he draws like a, like a dagger from his belt and says, there's more of us than there are of you. Get off your horses. Let me have what you got on you. Well, he said, you should have stopped at bloke, and then I'm going to go ahead and try to hit him with uh, a nice Eldritch Blast. <laughs> what? Yeah. Don't pull the blade on me. All right. Uh, roll initiative. Uh, there should be a macro for it. All right. Uh, this is for all the bandits. This is for Jimmy Snorrels. Okay. Uh, the first bandit is going to come out of the woods and he's going to uh, fire his crossbow at Sir Tiffin the Long. All right, let's see how, how this works here. Ten. So whoosh, flies over Sir Tiffin, uh, past Julia, Julius, but does not hit. Uh, the second one, again, shoots at Sir Tiffin Long, seeing him as, obviously, the bigger threat. Uh, this one misses a well. And the last one, uh, think, seeing that no one can hit Sir Tiffin, uh, goes ahead and shoots at him again. 
Oh, he does hit him. And does seven damage to Sir Tiffin. So you see, kind of on the side, Sir Tiffin reels, rears his horse around, and there's a bolt that goes in um, over his 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 breastplate. And Jimmy snarls, uh, holds his knife up at Julius Terrace, and says, "You gonna stop right there? Like I said, we got you outnumbered. We're gonna pin you to the floor." He's not going to attack. He's just trying to threaten. Him. He wants to yeah. Julius will just smile at him. And, uh, Eldritch Blast it is. Do it. Uh, damage 8. Tell me how that looks. As he's just blown off into the water. Uh, so Julius just looks at him, smiles, outnumbered. Only a real fool would rely on numbers against someone like us. And then his eyes glow. A burst of energy flies from his hand and throws Jimmy into the river. Yeah, Sir Tiffin's like, Lord, behind me! Spurs his horse forward and goes after the bandit like right in front of him and he's going to attack with advantage um, on this guy one uh, 12 and that's going to hit 8 and he's dead so he rides forward and cuts this one down and uh, blood just sprays up in the air as he rides across the bridge takes a sword swipes at him ah the guy's head just flops off into the air flops into the water and we're back to the top with the bandits um, both of them are going to make constitution save at 10 um, this one starts to run away okay the one here and the other one the other one stands his ground uh, shoots at Julius with his crossbow uh, 13 that would that would probably hit right barely yes, it does. three piercing so what does that look as a crossbow bolt hits you Yes, yeah, so you hear the, the twang of a, a bolt snapping and it flies and hits Julius in the shoulder. <laughs> um, but uh, he looks a bit unfazed. I should I should have said it whenever I did it. I have uh, I have this. Um, hold on. So I would have gotten um, one, two, six temporary hit points. Mm -hmm. So I look a bit unfazed by it. It's kind of turned my gaze over to him as I pulled from the, the five that I had, or six that I had, actually. And, um, he looks at the bandit. He struck him. You give him one chance and lay down your arms, and I won't tear you from me. So as you do that, Julius, you hear a voice in the back of your mind that says, Don't let him live, Lord Terrisk. It is a sign of weakness. Kill him now. Julius will think on it. I've changed my mind. And is going to use uh, a witch bolt on him. Okay. That is with advantage now, so if you miss the first one, you can do it again. 24. Yeah, 24, that kills him. What does that look like? So from uh, Julius's hands, um, red hot lightning comes out and just it envelops the man. Uh, <laughs> much like much like you would see in a cartoon, the skeleton shows, just holds it until the man is a smoking ruin in the ground. And then 
pulls the bolt calmly from his shoulder. Sir Tiffin, like, is wheeling her out on the bridge on his horse, and that bandit is, like, heading back towards town. He says, Your direction, my lord? Should I chase him down? Bring me his head, Sir Tiffin. As you say. And at this point, like, there's a scene of you see Sir Tiffin kind of running down this guy, and he has in his right hand his sword, he's, like, swinging it around, and <laughs> gallops past the guy and just impales his sword in his back and flies him up. And eventually, dismounts, cuts off the guy's head, and brings it back to Lord Terrisk. Your trophy, my lord. Yours, Sir Tiffin. You claimed him. I just wanted to see his head to make sure you'd done the deed. Kind of looks at his left shoulder. I'm uh, bleeding, my lord. I, I may require your attention. Of course. We'll see gate immediately. Come. Leave this trash. We'll have the village magistrate take care of it. Now as that scene fades, you see like almost like an old western movie. The camera behind Julius and Sir Tiffin as they're kind of uh, walking into town. Um uh, the camera's behind them, and like the sun's starting to set, and that sort of thing. Here, I see that. Yep. Perfect. Yes. So you're walking into. Um, you're walking into the town. At this point. And the sun is setting. You've left behind uh, how many bodies were there? Four? <laughs> yes. Uh, four bodies. Uh, the current of the stream is at least taking two of them away. Uh, the other ones are uh, bloodied and smoldering ruins. And um, as you walk into town, no doubt there are some villagers kind of at the fore who may have been kind of looking down the road. You see all the kind of windows and doors kind of, <laughs> kind of shudder against you again. It's like an old western movie when the gunman rolls into town. So tell me what that looks like. So Julius looks around and hmm. quite the introduction we've made for ourselves here, Sir Tiffin. For better or worse, I suppose. I'd say so, my lord. You're uh, very your father's instructions were to keep that sort of thing under wraps. Well, it would be remiss of me not to lend my aid to you as my protector when I'm able. Besides, <laughs> small folk make their stories. I can just deny it to my father anyway. Very clever, my lord. Very clever. <laughs> <coughs> A little trickle of blood coming from the corner of Sir Tiffin's mouth. I need ale and meat. Let's get that fixed first, Sir Tiffin. There's plenty of time for ale and meat. Perhaps the church will have a healer? Perhaps so. So you guys walk in, walk over to the church. As you walk in, uh, it's set up almost like a modern-day church. There's some pews in front. There's an altar to the resplendent one in the back. And as you walk in, there are four or five clerics deep in prayer and just Whoa. they're kind of chanting. And Sir Tiffin and Julius walk. Yeah. Julius would look about and wait for a bit of a pause in the, the prayer, or if it doesn't come soon enough, he will clear his throat loudly. <clears throat> One of the clerics kind of turns around. Oh! Oh my, we have visitors. Looks about. So you do into quite a lovely establishment that you have. He looks about. I imagine it looks kind of just a homely type of thing. 
the supporters of the resplendent one even here in Pine Bay Peak think little of themselves and mostly Lord. Can I be of service? I would ask your kindness for a favor. My man and I were entering town. We were beset by brigands. I was uh, hoping you could help him if he was injured in the fighting. A cleric comes up to Sir Tiffin. Sir Tiffin just kind of glowers down at him from on high. Ugh. Oh, yo, it seems your man is bleeding. Uh, was it that blasted Jimmy Storles? Yes, and he won't be bothering anyone else again for his folly. Of that you have my word. Ah, a strange visitor visits my house of prayer and comes complete with good deeds. Ha <laughs> ha, we are certainly blessed. Men, ladies, come, see to this man and his wounds. The three acolytes kind of stand up and you see that there's two women and one man and they lead Sir Tiffin off into another chamber and start to uh, take care of his wounds. I'm going to put him back up to 13 if you guys spend the night here. To Rask looks at the, the cleric we've spoken to. Is banditry often a problem here? No. No. Not usually. Not till of late. For some reason there are some very shady things going on bandits outside of town bandits in town I can't say what the cause of it is but well, I dare say that there's been more than your fair share of prayers said at this church to both the dead and the wounded I will certainly make note of it perhaps something can be done Perhaps so. For a small donation, I would give you a room and lodging for the night. And he kind of looked at you, and I'm, I'm guessing that you are dressed not as a commoner. You might be. Not even close, no. It's very, some, very clearly some someone important. Point. Yeah, it's but, very clearly someone important. Uh, full, full as, as, as men of the cloth are what to do, they he sees at least some small opportunity to make, make some coins. So he just requests two silver coins or something like that for the, a lodging for the night, something he probably thinks you can afford, but that wouldn't, wouldn't offend anyone. That would be probably expected, uh, this sort of thing. And uh, if you would accept, he'd put you up for the night. Julius smiles and uh, is going to go ahead and cross palms with two gold pieces instead. So it is important that we venerate the resplendent one. Oh. An unexpected surprise, but a welcome one, to be sure. My name is Friar Belsavius, and your name? Just to clarify, was I supposed to be coming here uh, in quietly and not revealing who I am? Yes. And he just kind of looks at him. Julius. Ah, Julius. Make yourself at home. We do have food and wine, although it is... Not perhaps of the type you would have expect or are accustomed to. Nonsense. All wine and food is welcome to me. And if there's nothing else, we're going to go ahead and see. Should be good. Right. You should be back in the inn, right? Yep. We are. Uh, so the night has passed, and it's uh, the next morning. 
Uh, Caleb Trundle Hill is at his room upstairs uh, having some breakfast. Uh, he has some uh, fried potatoes and uh, a roll and uh, what looks to be some sort of uh, meat on his plate. Uh, Tarkel, what are you having for breakfast? Eggs. I desire eggs. So his eggs are uh, put in front of him by the uh, serving lady as they wait for Fuliana to join him to join them the next morning. Yeah, she's a little slow to rise, <clears throat> but she will join them probably when they're halfway through eating. She kind of looks over the picked over food. Ah, it's kind of you to join us, Foliana. Here, pull up a chair. Yeah, Taylor kind of scoots the chair out for her. Is it like an I said, actual chair? Yeah, actual chair. Wow. All, All right. expenses on me. Very well. What do they serve in this place? All manner of pork, all manner of cow, all manner of chickens, and this uh, slightly stale bread. The walrus is poor. <laughs> it's walrus imported. Is he kind of it's imported. I don't think it's walrus. They said it was. <laughs> Filiana actually smiles at that a little. Well, Foliana, how does it feel to be seven coins richer? <laughs> Ten coins richer? Ten coins richer. Uh. She says there's a few extra ounces in my pocket, I suppose. And Dr. Taleb is munching at some stale bread, and most of his potatoes are done, and he kind of scoots his plate to the side. I suppose we have some planning to do. Uh, I would... if, if there's a servant, Foliana will call the servant over. Absolutely. Yeah, and start asking what could be served, what food, and she's clearly not pleased with any of it and finally settles uh, on some quail. The quail, uh, uh, the serving uh, lady uh, seems a little bit surprised that you'd be ordering quail. Uh, you might get the impression that the quail may not be quail, but she absolutely promises you that it is uh, the best quail served in Pine Break Peak. Uh, that's for sure. And uh, she asked if there is anything that you would like to go with your game bird. She says, I suppose you have wine hopefully better than last night's isn't it a bit early for that my lady she looks at him like she like he's addled too early for wine yes too early for wine <laughs> she just looks at the servant and says well what are you waiting for well then i suppose wine it is disappears and soon comes back with the wine and says it'll be a bit of a wait on the quail but I assure you it's worth it. Uh, there'd better be a wait. It takes good time to prepare it properly. And he disappears into the back and in the back uh, of the kitchen you hear Quail! They ordered quail? The quail! <laughs> There's like a bit of an argument that breaks out in the back. And it becomes quiet again. She seems actually a little pleased at that to have caused a bit of a stir. Uh, at that point, uh, Dr. Taleb picks up what he's saying. Again. Like I said, we have a bit of planning to do. I suppose that we should wait until nightfall to do this. Probably best since most people don't take kindly to. Uh... Researchers, researching graves, 
researchers. Yeah. They, right. they might get the wrong idea and dismiss us as common tomb robbers. Torkel, I would like your input on this, but I was thinking that uh, perhaps the two of you would uh, scout ahead up front to make sure there's no danger. After all, the lead researcher should not uh, put himself in harm's way. Do you know where we are going? Do you know, is it a stone coffin or is it buried in the earth? Well, that's just the point. I don't quite know. You, you've not scouted out the region. Well, I've scouted out the region, but there are legends here saying that the body is buried in a unknown location in the cemetery. Uh, but officially, um, yes, yeah. he's supposed to be in a stone sarcophagus. <laughs> well, I suppose there's probably only a few hundred of those that we'd have to dig up then. Well, we'll just look for the largest one, correct? Very famous man, <laughs> long lived, loved by many, founder of the town. And yet unmarked, you say. Why would it be large and attract attention if the intention was to keep it secret? So, just follow my lead on this one, will you? Mm, so you will lead us? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Sounds like a good plan. I suppose I'll lead you, Tarlson. What if we do this? We will have a picnic for lunch in the cemetery. And while we eat, we will find likely grave. Then, when it is dark, we will go back with a crowbar and pry it open. This is starting small. Dr. Trundle Hill seems to be deep in thought. I see the wisdom in this plan. Just like Miss Grendy here, it seems I didn't hire, hire you for just your muscles. What do you think, Foliana? She shrugs. I fancy a picnic. The grave robber family picnic. I prefer to be called a researcher, don't you, Torkel? Well, I better than a grave robber, I guess. Yes, Would better than a grave robber. Lower than a grave robber? A researcher? <laughs> Tonight, you're probably right. So then, I suppose I should get some wine to go. And perhaps the kind of meat that doesn't spoil? Yes. Smoked? Smoked salmon does not spoil. Smoked salmon, it is. Is there any, uh, is there any f decent food left on either of their plates? Yep. Uh, uh, Caleb has, like, half his potato not eaten. Alright, she'll take that and start eating on it since she has nothing to eat yet. Taylor doesn't say anything. As a good doctor, he is more than happy to see Foliana get her nourishment. <laughs> She's so pleased to please him. Well, shall we be off then? The day's getting away from us. And she rises. As you rise, the serving man comes out with your quote-unquote quail. Uh, it looks more like a pigeon, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. and she, she takes a tiny time. nibble of it and puts it back and says, there's no need for that, we're going on a picnic. And then brushes past him. Very well. So you guys uh, can head out then, uh, as long as there's nothing else you want to do in town. 
how far is the graveyard from the town? Oh, well, it's about a half day's journey, so by the time you would get... Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, it would be about noon. All right. Okay. I don't think I need anything. Nope. All right. We will follow you, Doctor. Tell you. All right. Let's see if this works here. We are small. You are small. Yeah. Should be in water. We are in water. There you go. Okay. See that should be daytime, right? Mm-hmm. Perfect. So, um, you have spent a half day journey, um, a journey to this site. Um, uh, it's a bright day in mid June, June the 12th, actually. And um, overhead, the clouds are white. Now, there's a, there's a calm breeze, and it's actually not an unpleasant journey. Um, you kind of go along a river on your way to this place. And make some small talk on the way. Uh, Taylor, are we on, are we on horses? Um, I don't think you would be on a horses this half half day journey. Just a okay. uh, quick ride up there. And Taylor Trundleville, uh, for all his talk of riches, uh, does not have a horse. <laughs> uh, so you make it there. Uh, as you approach, there are other uh, people there at the uh, cemetery. Uh, at the ruins, it's uh, somewhat of a local legend, and people come there to pray. Uh, they come there to do real research, and that sort of thing. And so, um, you're free to move around. Okay. Oh, Foliana will just kind of casually stroll in, looking around. Caleb kind of walks around as well and says, Ah, this place looks much older than 50 years old. Perhaps they've been burying their dead here for much longer than that. Looks like an old monastery. As they walk in, uh, Dr. Trundle Hill kind of gives a nod to a couple people praying in the courtyard and um, kind of uh, sits down on a stone and starts to look through some books. Just give me a moment here. Maybe I can figure out this whole situation. Foliana just walks a circuit around, just looking to see what she can see, peering into these little side rooms. Look like cloisters. So here is where a little bit of the collaborative wall building will come on because I have made a whole backstory to this place. So what type of things did you guys read on the place? Hmm. So the town was founded, um, you know, probably well over over 200 years ago, um, by old soldiers who didn't make it home from this giant war, and they started their building, uh, burying their dead, kind of around here. So, does this look like it predates those people, though? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um. Well, there are probably inscriptions, if it's that old, that Foliana cannot read, although she may recognize the script. 
Um, why don't you give me a history at 10? Awesome. That's very good. Um, so you can, you may not be able to read all the language, but you can see that some of the language uh, is is very, very, very old. Uh, it's not of the Mysterium uh, script, which is a blend of kind of almost a Latin and English, but it's uh, uh, almost of like a, a like runes and that sort of thing from the very first men that mm. fled into the north several hundred years ago. Juliana will say, I'm surprised they had the skill to erect such a structure back then. You also get the idea that even if they find the remains of the or the old, there must be must be more to this site than meets the eye. Yeah, so she's rather surprised to see that a place like this has been turned into a graveyard. Um, where where are they burying these people? Is it these things? Um, what we're going to say that most of the graves are kind of underneath this, and then kind of in that surrounding environs as you've walked through, there are mm. more kind of common gravestones and that sort of thing. So there's a crypt down below somewhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if the people that were buried here even had any idea what this place was. Not seem to be in alignment with nature. Seem to be posing fun. No. This must have been the home of a forgotten god. Now it's been taken for the purpose of bearing people believe in someone completely different. says you, you humans are very fickle people but we die so often no we must bury our dead we don't live forever well most of my people don't live forever either tales to the contrary what about the lifespan of elves in our game please no uh, I would imagine they can live hundreds of years, but most don't live that long. Um, this is not a friendly place. <laughs> um, and they are not... They're not a unified people. To the outside world, they present a unified picture, but there is a lot of infighting that goes on very quietly um, mm. they're a little proud and don't want that known they don't broadcast it to the world but um, they're her people are very ambitious people would have never guessed that from talking with Poliana <laughs> and soon Dr. Trundle Hill kind of stands up ah here it is, says, and kind of walks through the courtyard. And there are several acolytes praying underneath this tree here. What have you found, great researcher? Oh, not so much a great researcher, great reader of riddles and knower of rhymes, he says. Right here it says that the most blessed one the founder of Pine Break Peak has made his peace beneath the bows of its name. And he kind of looks at the tree up above, and it's like a, I know it looks like a autumn tree here, but it's a big pine tree mm -hmm. here. And it says that his bones rest beneath this tree. Does it look Sweet. bent or broken? tell me that 
else. I would imagine it. It looks like it, it. Perhaps it's a tree that is so badly bent and gnarled and misshapen that it looks like it should be breaking, but it has stood for centuries that way. Very well. Kyle looks to Tarleton. Did you bring a hoe and shovel? Mm, you brought the hoe. No wise cracks, Torkel. I could see that one coming a mile away. <laughs> to live, kind of shakes his head. Very well. <laughs> we retire to the uh, countryside. We have a long night. Yes, Doctor. Perhaps time for our pick. Is there anybody around who can hear our conversation? I mean, there are, but I mean, if you kind of like talk, you know, talk in hushed whispers and stuff, they're not. Yeah, it just sounds like he's up. Well, we'll have a long, busy night ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> We work for an idiot. Yeah. You guys got those shovels, right? Yeah, right. And the right, hoe. Let's, let's pretend to have our picnic now. Um, yes. So um, I assume uh, Torkel's carrying the picnic baskets. I'd love to see that. Um, Foliana certainly would not be bearing anything. Well, what does it look like this way? giant man carrying a picnic basket? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> actually, I think he probably brought the stuff and had set it down outside. <laughs> and then we walked in and looked around. Yeah. But I think there's probably a pile of stuff rolled up perhaps in a blanket or some piece of cloth. So it's not obvious we have shovels and crowbars and <laughs> such <laughs> items about us. <laughs> it's just a very large spoon. <laughs> Um, well, Foliana will, she, she, at least she brought in a blanket. She will spread it out and sit on it expectantly, uh, waiting for, for, uh, Tor Torquil to go fetch the stuff. Torquil goes and fetches the stuff. And Dr. Tundle Hill says, ah, this one is going to go off splendidly. I have a good feeling about it. Do you usually have good feelings about this endeavor? I have feelings. <laughs> Torkel wants to walk around the tree. Uh, he'll, he'll act as though he's praying, have his head down, but he's really scouting the ground around the tree to see if there are any depressions or markers or anything that would indicate where in this large area we might be interested in looking later. Uh, yeah. while, he's, while he's doing that, Foliana will say, so, Doctor, what exactly are you a doctor of? As I said, I'm a researcher into the science of life and death. It is a thin and very mysterious thread, Foliana, that separates life from death. Why? The practitioners of thumb source of magic will say it otherwise. I think that by researching the pure biology of the man, of the elf, the dwarf, I think we can gain unprecedented knowledge. These bones will tell me more than I need to know. Really? What's so special about these bones? You think the magic of his long life is in his bones. He kind of looks at you and raises his eyebrows. Perhaps. I've always heard elf blood would prolong life. And he looks at you and says, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> yes. An experiment for another day, perhaps, and another elf. She says, well, are you going to join us, Torkel? Let's eat. Tay 
Caleb partakes of his picnic. All right, we eat. <coughs> Caleb just looks around and kind of says very loudly, Well, we're finished praying. Time to go back to the village. <laughs> really loud, sir. <laughs> here. Fully honest. Yes, let. <laughs> Kind of retire to I don't know wherever they're, they're waiting until the nightfall. Yeah, she'll she uh, Fuliana suggests that maybe we should not be so obvious and at least make it look like we're retiring. May sir come you. back when the last visitor has left. So, if she hasn't already seen a good spot, she'll look for a vantage point that's not far from the cemetery where she could keep a watch to see when everyone has left. She'll kind of, if there's anybody still here, she'll take a tally of who's here and then they can wait until she's accounted for everyone. Absolutely. So you guys kind of head out, and Fuliana is going to keep watch. Yep. Torkoal will take a nap. Got a feeling I know who's going to do most of the digging. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be Fuliana, I assure you. Let me take a five minute bio real quick. And I'll okay. Be back. Okay. Very well. Very well. No baby, no, that's good. I'll be back too. Hang on a second. Pause the recording. I got combo. I got combat in Bo's first game. <laughs> just as planned. You want to call it combat? You just roasted a few guys. <laughs> Thank God they were minions, though. My goodness. Imagine oh, those being full, full bred brigands and I would have been, they would have been narrating my death scene at the beginning of the campaign. Well, there's got to be a bit of an intro. We are all first level. Or I, th I assume we are. Yeah, we are. I had to do it. It was, uh, it was pride fucking with me. Yeah, I've got the impression we're not a bunch of real nice guys. No. Not at all, apparently. No. <laughs> Grave Rob, definitely, um, <laughs> definitely leaning no, towards that's... evil, I think. It, it, it most like. Well, the, you know, the grave robbery is sort of turning to one of our more likable characters. <laughs> it doesn't seem very malevolent, does it? <laughs> Just some dudes making some money. It's probably... I would I would almost hesitate to call it neutral, in fact. <laughs> if we're going to look at alignment. I would say that um, killing a man because a voice in your head told you so is not very nice. And beating a man to basically death in your dungeon is probably not very nice either, but Stealing bones is looking like the morally uplifting part of the stuff. <laughs> right. we, we found our moral compass. Stealing bones for money. <laughs> Absolutely. I am back. Yeah, my little bathroom right next to my office has ghost nose for many a urinations that used to hear. Oh, or a raven. Ray, I think raven used to be on my <laughs> Raven, you still what? Legendary boat piss. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. At our age, I don't 
don't know what your age is, but at my age, it's my age, <laughs> common, very common. Well, it's more that he would broadcast it was what was uncommon. Oh, 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 I <laughs> well, that see. Was, that was in the days of Bo with Al. With like maybe, I think maybe I had one baby kid before three kids, and I RP like drinking all day, and then I we would, we would play, and and like the quality was not high, so I just I would just be like wasted. And, I got a piss. <laughs> and then we all heard it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now I have to like in, the, uh, like in that scene in Naked Gun with the, with the, yeah, mic- exactly. with the microphone still on. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, <coughs> I'm going to turn off the lights here. And um, you, you guys will all be able to see some stuff. But. Uh, uh, narratively, just kind of ignore what you probably can't okay. see. Uh, all right, let me get Mr. Tarbin. Mr. Tarbin, I love your night as well. Ooh, he, he is the giant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tarbin smash. Got bigger from far away. So, all right. Let me uh, turn the lights off here. Scoop trick of the light shining on his off. bald head. Now, um, you should, should be able to see Tarbin. Now, Tarbin, turn on your torch. You should see a torch. Turn that on. Tell me what it does. Make sure it works. There it goes. There we go. Perfect. Got it? Uh, yep. All right. Cool. So the scene has changed, and this is the... The, the same night that uh, Foliana and the doctor and uh, Tarleson uh, have had their uh, infamous picnic and they're making camp on a hillside south of the uh, of the cemetery of the the old I don't know what you could call it a ruined cathedral type of thing and um, for the past week or so uh, Tarbin and uh, Sir Carl have made their way uh, first down the mountain paths, then over the hills, and um, then at a small village they got a small skiff, and they are heading down the stream towards the meeting place uh, that has been arranged uh, between you and Julius Teresk. And uh, the scene is one of you gently at night time floating down the stream and you see in the distance kind of rising before you um, some ruins of what looks like an old cathedral uh, kind of on either side of the stream are gravestones kind of pointing hither and there thither at odd angles like 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 jagged teeth and I will leave it up to you Sir Carl kind of turns to you and Are you still there, Tarvin? You're either more silent than usual. Yes. Lord Julius should be around here somewhere. Tarvin kind of plods on through into the ruins. <clears throat> yeah, Sir Carl goes ahead and kind of takes the skiff and, and ties it up. And uh, he kind of hangs out here and says, Very well, stay nearby. Keep an eye out. Tarbin looks around the, what he can see of the dark runes. And uh, Julius and Sir Tiffin are kind of coming in from the north. Uh, Julius, you can turn your torch on if you would like. 
and I'll let you RP that entrance. So Julius and Tiffin would have tied their horses, dismounted, and looked towards the the structure, perhaps seeing some of the light coming from a torch within. He looks at Sir Tiffin and it's a wonder a man as big as Lord Giant's blood can even travel in secret. Well, he's not that long. <laughs> Still, a man with that kind of reputation, you think everyone would know what he looks like? Yeah. Well, it's not that most people don't see Giant's blood they don't remember seeing him voluntarily if you get my drift a man who carries that sort of reputation makes it easy to well you don't want to get involved a fair point or you may want to get involved in depending on your purpose does have a particular set of skills, my lord. He does indeed. Well, let's not tarry, I'm sure. None of us are too excited to be up at this hour. Sir Tiffin kind of you know, takes his long sword out and holds his uh, torch out in front of him and uh, goes into the cathedral. will follow them. I see a light, Carl. This may be Lord Julius. Eventually, in the uh, at the chamber, uh, Tarbin, you see a uh, giant knight followed by uh, someone with pale hair uh, behind them. Tarman recognizes Julius, comes forward. <coughs> ah, Lord Julius. It's good to see you. You as well as Lord Giant's blood. And uh, Julius will root around and bag perhaps that he has and hand over a bottle of wine that he had purchased um, to Lord Giant's blood. I heard you like a good red, though my father wasn't specific on whether it was wine or blood, so I took a chance. <laughs> you honor me, my lord. Thank you. Julius nods. So... I understand that you had some news for me. Should we stand for it or get comfortable in the pews? Uh, if you would like, we can sit. Julius nods. And, Very well. He looks at Sir Tiffin with the long blade out. No need for that now anymore, Sir Tiffin. We're all good friends here. Starman will wander around here to the pew. Yeah. Kind of creaks when he sits down. <laughs> Bench makes constitution check to see if it breaks. No, just kidding. <laughs> My men captured a spy. Upon speaking with the man, I discovered he was from Count Von Severus. The Conventus marches on Von Severus and the Vestberg. Two legions. <laughs> oh, Von Severus. What an absolute moron. What could he have possibly done to arouse such anger? I did not find that out, my lord. But I believe his man was sent looking for aid. Of course he is. 
sensible too, seeing as they wouldn't like they wouldn't stand a chance against you know one Conventus Legion. Two would certainly defeat them, I think. Mm. But this is an interesting opportunity. Tarbin kind of grins at that and leans back. Indeed. My father would stand poised to take it all. We could never allow Conventus to take Von Cyrus's hold, but we've never had a great relationship with him either. No, your father certainly wishes Von Cyrus no, no good. <laughs> yes, it would be a great deal of power changing hands depending on how the cards unfold. Julius kind of walks around and rubs his chin. Was there anything else that you know about this situation? Mm, no, my lord. That was all I got from the man. We shall have to inform my father appropriately, I suppose. Tarpon nods, of course, my lord. And with that, the scene fades and we find ourselves. Um, on a hill not far to the south of the cathedral and there uh, Dr. Trundle Hill, Foliana and Tarleson all sit. Uh, maybe Foliana could be a little bit closer um, but what they see obviously is they see kind of in the night a pair of torches kind of drifting down the stream from the north and then kind of embarking and they see another pair of torches kind of Entering the, um, entering the cathedral from the north, and both of them kind of disappear to the inside. Through the windows, they can see kind of flickering lights. And uh, uh, Dr. Taylor is just like, oh, Blast! Someone beat us here! Yes, Fuliana was just about to pick up a shovel, and she says, <laughs> Yes, torches. <sighs> more Curses, more researchers! Yes, more researchers, I suppose. This is a very popular research spot. She says, she looks at the doctor and says, were you expecting someone tonight? I was like, expecting someone? I wasn't expecting someone. I'm not going to gro rob great research while I'm expecting company. Perhaps we'll Can let them dig first. Can we see anything about the people in the lights? Oh, you, can see, you have uh, yeah, dark vision or something, don't you? I think, right? I do. Yep. Um, so I'm not going to give you details, but um, you can see that um, uh, the others can't, but but you could see that uh, basically the features of Tarvin Giant's Blood, Tarisk, uh, Sir Tiffin Long. And uh, Sir Carl the Drake, uh, you can see their features as they're walking in, um, just through the gloom uh, because of your very keen elf eyesight. Foliana says, "Wait here, I'll be back." Don't worry, I'm not moving. And she ah. starts to pick her way over there quietly. Poor Kale doing. Can I just sit back down and stretch out on the ground? Ah! 
with our gun, I will dig. When she gets to the wall here, she kind of crouches down and slowly edges along um, to try to keep the wall between her and them. So what does that look like as you kind of inch forward, you hear their talk of politics um, through uh, the windows. You can you can likely see these two two knights there. Um, maybe they have a whetstone out, kind of sharpening their swords. Mm -hmm. And the two men there are on a pew talking. Yeah, she just wants to get close enough so that she can hear what they're talking about. Yeah. So you catch the tail end of that conversation moving on the Vestberg and sending word back to Fristenfeld. Um, Once you make a stealth check? I expected that. <laughs> and why don't uh, you other two boys make a uh, percent? All right, so neither one of them see you, so what do you do? I'm just going to stay and listen. I just want to hear what they're talking about, see if All I right. can figure out what their intentions are. The, certainly the talk of politics interests her. So let's go back on the hill. Uh, Trundle Hill's like, Tolson, do you see anything? He'll open his eyes and say, I see the night sky. Uh. Researchers must know that they can sit and wait. So, sit and wait. Maybe they'll dig for us. Maybe they will. I'll sit and wait as long as I have you <coughs> by my side. I have nothing to fear. Of course not. Lay back. Let the elf girl do whatever she does. Filiana is also, while she's listening, she's ba she's carefully picking out a quick escape route if they start to move back in her direction that would avoid, you know, kicking stones or anything. Mm -hmm. So you guys can continue your conversation. Yeah. Okay. So... <clears throat> Julius looks at Tarver and looks over his shoulder at the knights and sits back on the pews and scratches his chin. Can we speak openly but softly, Lord, John Lord Giant Spirit? Tarver casts a glance around, of course. How do you feel about your service to my house so far. Is it everything you wanted? This is between you and I. Nothing you say here will go back to my father, other than what you've reported to me already. I suppose... Like more from our relationship. <laughs> Very grudgingly. <clears throat> he smiles and says, I, Of course. You know, I know a little bit about the histories of your ancestors. Great mountain tribesmen come down from the hills and smash our heads in, take gold women, whatever they wanted. Ancestor. Tar Tarbin almost laughs at that. And, uh, and then I can't remember if it was great grandfather or great great grandfather, but one of the two offered you knighthood, service to the realm, to placate you in his eyes, keep you from destroying everything we own, Buzzard's Roost. A good deal for you and yours. Turning in your furs for steel, your huts for castles, the 
good deal. Tarvin slowly nods his agreement with that. But you also traded in something else. You traded in your fights, your wars. And if I'm to be so bold with Lord Johnny's blood, you traded in a bit of your identity that day. What made your people strong. He leans back a bit on the pew. Yes, it's true. <coughs> Where's your great rating? Is on the blood. <coughs> no, the rating was on our blood. Looks to Julius to continue. Where's your great war, Lord Giant's War? You are more feared in these lands than any other man. Wayne Fristenfell is terrified of you. They say you could crush a man's skull with your bare hand. One hand, not two. But where's your war? Where's your great glory? Where are your rays? Tarvin rubs his massive hands together. I take your point, my lord. You know, there is a great wide world out there beyond just Fristenfeld and the Buzzard's Roost. You don't need the vessel for it as well. Great wide world. My father, my lord father, the Count Kilbass, is a good man. He's good to his people, good to his subjects, I would say. But he's an old lacks the fires of youth and ambition. He misuses your potential, Lord Giant's Blood. Heavily. Imagine your men and armies put to real use. You could be conquered by the mountains, you could be conquered by countries. Whole cities would be yours to raid. My father keeps you in the buzzard roost to placate you, while petty nobles in Fristenfeld laugh and giggle great mountain of a man who sits in his keep. They call you a dumb fool. They say this in the open. Scowls as he hears this. But I think there is a great way for you to return to your old roots. To find new glories. Yes, my lord. And what would that be? He leans forward somewhat eagerly. I think it is good to have a Tarrasque on the throne. But I think it's important to have the right one. If you get my meaning. Yeah, Tarvin may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but he gets your meaning. <laughs> yes, I take your meaning, my lord. There will be some things to do, but I think now will be the best time for it. If you help put the right to Rask in his proper place, you will own much more than Buzzard's Roost. I won't keep the pen boy either. You'll bring war. You'll conquer. You will lead armies upon armies. Small steps, though. Darwin nods slowly. Yes, but have a care, my lord. Should your father get wind of your ideas? He just sort of shakes his head. Yes. Yes, my lord father would not much appreciate it. <coughs> he wants me to succeed, but probably not so soon. closely going for you. Your 
for now, I recommend you keep this between us and only your most trusted of men. Of course. Oliana starts to creep away at this point. So yeah, so we'll go to Foliana and then and then over at Tarleson. So what's Foliana doing? Um, when she heard that last bit, it sounds like the conversation's coming to a close and she her her, her little um, political brain is is spinning right now. Um, and she's trying to decide what to do with this information but right now she needs to get away without being seen so she is trying to keep focused on her path and not on her thoughts at the moment so she's going to try to retrace her steps without drawing any attention to herself so so as the very deft and stealthy elf picks her way back through the ruins uh, out of the ruins towards the hilltop. Uh, Tarleson and Trundle Hill are back there. And uh, Trundle Hill uh, opens his eyes and he sees on the far side, he sees on the far side of the um, cemetery of uh, the cathedral, uh, not, not two torches, but several torches kind of uh, coming uh, coming into the, the the north entrance of the place. North being the top of the the top. Yep. Yep. Torkel hasn't had enough time to rig a danger signal with uh, Foliana, so he will simply draw his weapon and crouch and wait to see whether she gets out or not. Can you see the uh, NPC torches or not? Mm -hmm. I can. Yes, yes. Alright, perfect. All right, I'll just light a few of them then so you can see. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what's Tarleson doing as he sees the torches kind of heading into the compound? He will pull out his uh, battle axe and crouch looking to see if he sees Foliana coming out or whether he needs to go in to help. Trundle Hill's like, Holy, this is not good. This is not good at all. How are we going to get our prize? Maybe we shall wait till tomorrow? I, I'm certain they're not here to steal the body. But almost like a movie. As this <clears throat> happened, as this happens, um, the people inside, um, you uh, you can hear a gruff voices saying, Inside! Turn the place upside down! We want to find the bones of old Elgar, if it's the last thing we do. <laughs> uh, Foliana, uh, Foliana hears, it, hears it first, uh, but Carbon and, and, and Terra's can well. Uh, okay, she. Th this does not change her course of action. <laughs> she is going to continue that. <clears throat> but now she's got even more to think about. And she moves faster. <laughs> yeah, I'd say a little faster, even if she's trying to stay cool. Yeah. yeah. And when so she you... get... go, yeah. ahead. go ahead. Sorry, no. Go ahead. What, what happens? No, no. All that happens is that Tarbin and Tara start to see like flickers of, of torchlight kind of um, yeah, enter the place kind of from around the corner. And, you know, they hear the voices saying that. But then the scene kind of flips up to Fuliana at this point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fuliana comes back to the camp um, and sees uh, Trundle Hill and goes up to him and in a very quick deft uh, maneuver that she's practiced many times her dagger is out um, you know the intention is for him not to see it and she just comes up to him like she has something to say and she grabs him by the shoulder and whips the dagger up to his throat and what she is says, this? 
What are you not telling us, Doctor? There is nothing I'm not telling you. Then why are those men here to rob on the same night that you're here? Too much to be a coincidence. Like I said, many uh, kind of talks, but as he talks, the dagger is pressed against his Adam's apple, and maybe like a trickle of blood comes out. Many small steps may have <coughs> left a trail. It's the secret. The answer to the answer. Answer to, to the problem what? of magic. Uh, uh. The problem of magic. I make a history check. All right. Ten. So you know the problem of magic is a euphemism for the conundrum magic. Mm, it's the whole okay. thing that causes users of magic to have an accelerated death and accelerated rate of aging. Ah. Uh, okay, yes. She says, and you think you're going to find the secret of that. Who else knows about this? Obviously those men. How many more? I tell you the truth when I say I do not know who they are. And um, you can roll for it, but uh, the uh, there is there is nothing there is nothing false in this man's voice mm -hmm. who is currently getting his throat cut by a she elf. Yeah, she just kind of she's not very strong, but she she kind of knows how to maneuver someone so she just kind of puts a one foot behind his ankle and just kind of pushes him down onto the ground oof kind of falls on his bottom and she turns to Torquil you hear the other 20 gold pieces clink as you do that <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Gar? <sighs> she says, I don't know what the bigger score of tonight is. There's someone here planning, a, a nobleman planning to murder his own father, and <laughs> someone else coming to discover the secret of the conundrum. <laughs> we seem to have stumbled on something big. Uh, can you make me a history, Mr. Eskimo? <laughs> Mr. Eskimo. <laughs> They're not Eskimos. That's, that's Monsieur <laughs> Leskimo to you. <laughs> you don't know what the hell the conundrum magic is? Yeah. And really don't care. You don't care. <laughs> she says... Either way, there's money involved, potentially a lot. Well, perhaps we should wait and see what happens. Or do you think we can take them all? I don't know how many there are. How many um, have you seen? Four or five. This is nothing. <laughs> but then there's the other group. And in fact, at that, she looks back to see if if there's any evidence that the other group with torches is doing anything different. Are they just still out there in the open like that? Uh, they've entered the building, and you get the feeling that Pretty soon, everybody's going to see each other. All right. She says, as soon as those two groups see each other, there will inevitably be a, a toss-up here. She says, I think we want to be ready to capitalize on that. She goes to one of the picnic blankets and unrolls it and starts to string her short bow. A 
with your trundle hill. So, so what's what's the plan? This is what I hired you for. I'm not much good with knives, bows, or swords. Clearly. Be good at being quiet, then. <laughs> I can do that. He'll get his javelins out, I guess, in case those are necessary. But he's already got his axe, his battle axe. All right. So the swing scene switches back to Tarvin and Tarisk. What do you guys do as you hear the voices and you need the torches? Uh, Tarvin's all, all, already mentioned that he douses his own torch, so what are you guys doing? Tarras looks past him. Did you bring more men? No, they're not mine. <laughs> yeah, he looks, tries to look through and see if he can see who they are. They might have heard us. As you do that, you hear more voices. Spread out! Turn over every pew. Open every sarcophagus. Any amount of ground, dig it up. You hear a voice say, and you hear, you know, people start to kind of enter enter the area. You see, you see torches. They don't pay any heed to you. Until one of them does. Uh, Tarbin and Terrace, you see, uh, just a look, looks like a common man with a torch. He goes into the sanctuary, he turns to the left, and he looks at you. And he starts to open his mouth. What are you guys doing? Yeah. Oh. Julius looks at him and then sighs heavily and Leave none alive for a giant squad. Stands up from the pews. Tarbin charges the guy. <laughs> All right. Um, we shall roll initiative. Do you want us to roll down here as well? Um. Do you got? Uh, let me hang on. Still getting used to this new audio system. It's actually nice, but I'm just not used to it. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, yeah. Why don't you just go ahead and roll it? That make it easier for me. Looks like Julius is first. So Julius will uh, take his leave of the violence initially, um, trying to follow uh, Sir Tiffin the Long's suggestion that maybe he not be so blatant in his use of uh, of spellcraft, and he will simply wait next to the stairs. But if anyone I think you can do whole held actions. Um, if anyone yes, if anyone approaches him with hostile intent, uh, he's going to be prepared to unleash fury on them. Eldritch Bolt, specifically. <coughs> Otherwise, he, ex well. he motions to Sir Tiffin the Long and Sir Carl the Drake to join Sir Giant's Blood and Lord Giant's Blood in uh, removing this filth. And Sir Tiffin, like, draws his sword and takes a shield from over his back, he says, On me, Lord Terrisk, we shall not be harmed. Uh, the grave robbers, for their part, uh, they hear the calmer says, There's someone else here! <laughs> they, no! <laughs> they, <laughs> they all kind of uh, move their speed into the uh, area of... of uh, most, uh, no one home but us chicken. Yeah, let's say they're there. He can come here. He can come here. And they all draw their weapons and stuff, and they get ready for a fight. Uh, Sir Carl the Drake 
Uh, Sir Carl uh, does the same. It's like, Lord Tarvin, I don't know. I know you don't need my help, but uh, nonetheless, here it is. He kind of has his shield and he moves to uh, Tarvin's side. And uh, that will be his turn. Tiffin does the same thing. And the spy uh, will burst into the room and he's going to draw his weapon. And now it's up to Tarkel. I think can. If, you, if you dash, you can move what, twice your speed? Right. Yes. Yeah, 60 yep. feet. 60 feet. Scale is correct. I don't care for squares. <laughs> I think we skipped Tarbin. Did we skip we Tarbin? Yeah. He was 18. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a man that cannot be skipped. How did you not see him? I know. Tarbin, you're up. Uh, so Tarbin actually would have gone before the spy, so... All right, spy's charged. back here. That's fine. You can leave him there, but he, would, he wouldn't have been there, so Char Tarbin would have charged the commoner. Oh, what's that look like? Uh, he's going to run up and smash the guy with a maul, uh, assuming he can hit him. Yes, and he meets his maker, so what does that mean? Uh, Tarman just runs up, maul up over his head, brings it down, just crushes the guy. Wait, no, Doc! <laughs> he falls over the pew, kind of slumped over it, the big dent in his head, lifeless. <laughs> All right, now Torquel is up. If he oh, can, the, he wants to get to that doorway. Time. What'd you say, Raven? Now you need the spy. Yeah. Well, the spy. I don't would... think he would have moved there after that. <laughs> yeah, he, he would. He, he'd still run in. <laughs> something yeah, tells he'd still me. do something, whether it was the same thing or not. All right. Okay. Uh, Tarkel, yes, you can get through that doorway. Uh, he just goes to that doorway. Stands right in it. Yep. You see all these people in there, and they say, There's another one! Get him! You will wait for them to come get him. Foliana. Uh, she is moving to this doorway. Her goal, how, uh, actually she probably wants to get here. Her goal is to not be seen. So she is not going to move super fast. So she probably... I think with uh, everything... For, for here, she's fine, yeah. yeah with so... everything going on, I think you could get there. Because they're okay. kind of distracted. No roll necessary. All right. Then she just kind of gets to this wall here, and she's kind of quickly catches her breath, and she's kind of ducked down behind there for the moment. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say is uh, roll a stealth with advantage against this guy here. Okay. That's a 22. Let's see if he beats it. And... uh yeah, why not? Uh, probably not. No, Oof. he doesn't see you. He doesn't see you. And so the, the commoners are up. Uh, this guy actually does, though. He runs right past you, Foliana, and moves to Tarkel. And he, he has a like a, a torch in his left hand and just like a club on, with his right hand. And he's like, bats at Charles. Boys, get him! There's more of us than there are of them. Ooh, 18. Actually might hit. It does. <laughs> what do you know? Four damage, Mr. Tarlson. Okay. Uh, the other commoner here moves uh, 30 and attacks Sir Carl the Drake. It hits! Wow. They're desperate. These men you know. came prepared. 
now. Yes. Ooh, two, one. Tank. And the others uh, simply move into the field of battle. All right, Julius, you're up again. So Julius sees the battle erupting around. Julius looks about and sighs again and looks at uh, Sir Tiffin. Go cut off their retreat. I'm going to get involved. He kind of cracks his knuckles. No one can live, Sir Tiffin, remember. Unless I say so. As you rush forward, you hear <laughs> in the back of your brain stem. So uh, <laughs> Julius will go around to the side, seeing um, Giant's Blood's man take a blow from the club. Mostly ineffectual, but back some of bit. And Julius looks at the man and rears back his arm and will throw some of his Eldritch Blast at this commoner here. And he's toasted. What does he look like? Uh, so... Julius flings a, a beam of blue energy into the man and just pretty much melts his skin, um, exposing some flesh and bone as he just kind of crumples into a heap in front of Sir Carl. Sir Carl is like poised to take his head off and <laughs> just kind of looks at you like, huh? The magic is so rare in this world that he's very perplexed. He looks at Sir Carl. Mind your lord, plenty of time to talk about it later, sir. All right, the grave robbers. Um, the, the one next closest to Fuliana uh, make a stealth again with advantage. Oh, jeez. There's no way. I'll take the 24. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't see you. Uh, this one, uh, one of them will head, uh, actually dash and in, dash into the, um, I don't know what you would call it, congregation hall. I need to go to church more. This one will dash here. He will move 30 to here. He will move 30 to here. And this guy will also dash into the congregation hall. Sir Carl the Great Drake will come forward and that, that blow that was meant for the commoner, he instead aims at the Grave robber. 15, that hits. And 10. Uh, that kills that one. <laughs> Cuts his arm off, spins around, and is like stabbing through the front. <laughs> uh, Sir Tiffin the Long um, basically stays at Sir Tarek's side. And Tarbin, you're up. Tarbin, uh, thinking that the spy looks like the more important of these guys, not covered in shit, will run at him and smash with them all. Uh, that hits him. Was that 10 damage? Uh, attack, yep. That's 50. No, wait. Carbon hit with a dagger? Oh, that's just what it says when I click the mall, Mac. Uh, never mind. Oh, that's just the GM's problem. <laughs> 15. Uh, I'll fix that next time. Yeah, no worries. I, stats are right, though. Yes, looks <laughs> like it. Oh, yes. So, Ow. Um, do you want to kill him or knock him out? Yeah, I don't think at this point Tarbin's thinking about... That's probably the char character thing to do is probably just kill him. Yeah, he, he'd just smash the guy's head. So, so yeah, he's dead. What does that look like? Uh, this time, 
yeah. yeah. Well, sort of, sort of Gallagher-esque, I guess. <laughs> that is the best description I've heard. Of uh, but this time he doesn't actually get a clean shot on the guy's head. Comes down more on his at right shoulder. At the source of blood splatter. All right. Uh, the Von Severus spy is no more. Uh, Torquel. Seven on him. That kills him. Uh, can I knock him out instead? Yes. It's like a shovel. Takes the axe and just kind of shovels it into his stomach and knocks the wind out of him and just drops him. Oh! He just kind of gets thrown back a little bit. He's kind of like... Gets thrown up back against this column and <laughs> cracks his head and slumps to the ground. Foliana. Uh, yeah, in one rather fluid motion, she whips a an arrow out of her quiver and knocks it on her short bow as she's rising and turning to look through this window and sees a good target right there that's kind of not in anybody else's vision as far as she can quickly perceive so she takes a shot at him twenty three uh I believe you get you get like an extra uh for stealth for sneak attack oh yeah I get my sneak attack as well because they so did roll not that was that was that four or d6 uh, I'm sure I think it's just a d6. Yep. So I'll well, just roll a d6. With with that, actually, because he had nine hit, hit points, that's enough. That's enough to kill him. Yep. That goes right in the center of his body mass. And then she kind of spins back around and goes for another arrow. Julius. Julius is going to look to Giant's Blood, believing he's going to be just fine uh, from what it looks, and is going to continue uh, walking forward um, rather calmly, um, looking out into the hall, I think I can get there, and seeing the rest of the men kind of pushing their way in. He sees this man here, and that looks good enough. And, uh, no! 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 <laughs> Um, he will throw another Eldritch Blast towards him. Uh, that does hit. Same kind of thing. Melts the flesh. His eyes kind of um, superheat and melt in his skull as he slumps over. So just RP-wise, the rest of you guys are not even seeing this sort of uh, magic power and and Fuliana, even um, even in the high courts of the elves, there are, are mages, but not mm -hmm. like this. Has she? Did she see that when she's taking a quick shot? Yeah, I think so. Like that, just because it lightens. Yeah. Okay. It lights yeah. Up. You're like, what the heck? You know. And she'd certainly know what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now her mind is really spinning. Grave robbers are up. Um, the one closest to Tarbin Giant's blood points his crossbow at him, but he's so close he's going to have to do it with disadvantage. Not sure he'll miss. No! No, he does 22. not. 22. Doesn't get a critical, though. <laughs> no. 22. Um, so what, five damage? It's actually four. The one is supposed to be the critical. Yeah, if he hit advantage, then it would be. Yeah, because you, you roll double your weapon damage, so he would have rolled 2d8. Um, got it. So, got it. so he gets to 22 for disadvantage. Four. It's four. All right. So take give yourself four. So this guy, Stung, is, is a bee stinging elephant, right? 
So he reflexively brings up his crossbow, boom, thunks it, and it sticks into Torben's like like right shoulder. Um, the other uh, grave robber there, close to him, he does not have disadvantage. He's like, "I'm on you, brother," and he does the same thing. Twenty-one. Oh, my. Oh. Nine. Oh. Oh. oh, and that's that enough. It? The mountain falls. Yes. Who says D and D can't be dead at level one? <laughs> So what does that look like as, as this next one gets you in the gut? Uh, hang on. Actually, I have some this. They got him. He probably has something that's going to take that play. <laughs> no, he's probably just going to keep going. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> my God. Wow. Roll a okay. 1d12 plus 3 then. <laughs> Just don't roll a 0, Raven. It's good. Oh, never mind. 5, That's 8. So, eight. Yeah. Wow. So how's it look like as you like shrug it off? Uh, the first one pierces into Tarbin's shoulder. He looks down at it, scowls. The second bolt comes in and just rings off of his armor. Ding! And Tarbin looks up at the two bowmen and grins. And they, uh, you start to look this look of fear within their eyes. Uh, a, a grave robber uh, near Tarleson, seeing that he's a, he's a little wounded, he is going to go ahead and shoot his crossbow at him. Eleven, that's going to miss. So, clink, clink! It goes off like that door frame uh, uh, near him. And that means Sir Carl the Drake is up. He's just going to move up close to Tarbin. Sir Tiffin, again, is Tarisk's shadow. So, Tarbin, you're up. And let's see, it was the first guy's bolt that actually did the damage. So, Tarbin just turns to him, rears back over his head with the maul. And brings it down with everything he has. And the guy says, wait, time out, time out. Uh, ten, and he's, he's gone. <laughs> Again. Um, the remaining grave robber is there. Uh, this is DC 10. He fails. He's, he's going to, he's going to flee next time seeing this, unless you guys stop him, which I'm sure. <coughs> Alright, Torquel, you're up. Move to him to attack if I can. Absolutely. Oh, God. <laughs> guys are rolling quite well. Alright, what do you do to this poor lad? I think I just take his left arm off. <laughs> his left arm goes off. He falls to the ground. Ah! It just sort of slowly bleeds out until he goes pale and unresponsive. Foliana. Uh, she spins around again and sees at there's least one this. More, there's one more guy. That... Well, yeah. he's unresponsive. Yep, that guy's unconscious. Oh, okay. Does she see this guy there? Um, if your character can see, then she can see him. <sighs> yeah, you see him, like, turning to run. And you don't have a voice in your mind, unlike Julius. That says, <laughs> no, no, and she's not exactly sure she wants to draw any attention to herself. She, she draws back to take the shot, and then thinks better of it, and, and relaxes, and just kind of crouches down and kind of calls out in a look in a in a stage whisper Torkel it's <clears throat> enough I 
getting off. All right, so the lone grave robber is up again. And he's going to dash out the back. 60. You guys see him bolt for it. Julius, what are you doing? I would look to Giant's Blood and his man. Don't let him escape. None of them can leave. And Julius turns his attention in here. He thinks he can see someone from the shadow. Yeah, yeah that, that guy. guy yeah. Julius just kind of begins approaching him slowly, um, and uh, just kind of as he no, no, as a puddle no, begins to form at his no, no. <laughs> a little puddle under his feet. If he if he if he's holding his hands up and drops his if he drops his weapon, is the... he drops his club. <laughs> yeah, look at him. And... They just thought they were going to rob a grave. Yeah, and Julius is going to slowly approach him. Um, hands behind his back, not wielding any weapons or anything like that. He's just walking him down. If he tries to run, Julius will try to blast him down. But Nothing for me yet. What, Sir Carl? But I've seen this scrum down here going on. I'm thinking so. Oh, yeah. yeah. I would take note of it. We don't have torches, by the way. Just putting that out there. Probably they, they do, though. Probably the mm -hmm. ambient light. You probably see that. Okay, too. yeah. Uh, the two knights, Yeesh. not much. Uh, Tarbin. Tarbin, what are you doing? What I'm going to do dashing I, after the escaping. Yep, I'm, I'm just going to do an opposed athletics. See who, if he gets away or not. Sound good? Works for me. Um, athletics. Oh, <laughs> you don't want to be caught by him. So what's it look like as you catch him outside of the temple? Uh, Tarbin runs up behind the guy, just tackles him to the ground. Ugh! Please, please, let me be. Hmm. My, my wife, she's, she's pregnant with our seventh child. <laughs> yeah, no, no mercy. Tarbin crushes his head. Ah! I ah. guess, I guess seven is all you'll have then. <laughs> All right, I, I guess we can say that the, uh, um, we'll say that the combat's over. Yeah, so Julius would um, be heading over to the commoner. Is Torkel trying to hide it all in the torchlight? Or... He's standing right there right now, haven't had another round yet. Julius looks at him and kind of squints, looking a bit confused because he's got he's got bodies next to him that are the men we're just fighting. So he takes note of it. He's going to continue walking with this commoner for now. He points over at this man down here. He's seen. Don't move, please, if you would. Julius will look at the commoner and pull a dagger. Yeah, when Torkel gets close to Fuliana, she says, You heard him, no one live. Let's get out of here now. Julius looks at the commoner and pulls the dagger in his throat. Why are you here? Jarman will come plodding back from running that guy down yeah the two Holy knights are they're kind of like it's just it's just what you guys see like the two knights are filtering their way in just like a bunch of badasses walking in yeah foliana is already moving away 
he's not sticking around to see this. Commoners. I, I was just paid ten silver coins to help the Jaha, my lord. Ah, uh, uh, please have mercy. I know you didn't show such kindness to my my friend George, but uh, uh, please show this kindness to me. Who paid you ten silver, and how do you know I'm a lord? Well, uh, uh, small folk don't dress like you do, and they don't shoot lightning from the finger, so... Wrong answer. No, that's, that's a fair point. You didn't answer my other question, though. He presses the dagger tighter. Who paid you? He points his hand and says, the, the man that ran in there, although I doubt that he still lives... Yes, I imagine not. What were you being paid to do exactly? Dig up what? Well, well, there's a old legend. I I think it's nothing more than a wives' tale. But ten silver coins is ten silver coins. And, well, they they meant to find the old bones of Elfgar. Old oh, says he's buried here. Why? I don't know why. I just take their money. He's an old man. Where is the grave? I don't rightly know, my lord. Like you may have heard, they said tear the place apart. They don't know where the vault is in. Do you know anything else about this job you have? Uh, shakes his head. No, no, no. Then I send you to death quickly, and I will shove the dagger through his neck. And... <laughs> Slumps to the ground, lifeless. His hands kind of come up to you as they go frozen, and then his eyes go lifeless. And he... oh. Yeah, Julius Slumps looks him down. all the way down until his eyes start to fog. And... <laughs> takes his dagger and wipes it on the man's clothes before sheathing it and turns around. <sighs> he looks at uh, Carl, Tippin, and Tor uh, Tarmo. Did you get them all? Is this one down here still alive? Uh, he's unconscious, but he's alive. Tarbin will stomp on him as he walks by. Oh, curb stomp. <laughs> <laughs> Just another Gallagher moment. <laughs> and I don't believe Tarbin ever saw Folion or Torkel, so as far as he knows, yes, they're all dead. Uh, Julius. Uh, did Julius see Torkel? I think I did from the ambient. I told him to stay there, yeah. but uh, it looks like he didn't. <laughs> uh, he and intentionally moved when you told him not to. <laughs> Good. Indeed. Um, so yeah, Julius looks and... I don't see anyone carrying a head with long, shaggy black hair, so I don't think all of you did. Sir Tiffin comes up to you. Shall we search the environs, my lord? Briefly, and don't kill these ones right away if you find them. Carl! Is Trundle Hill still there? He's up on the hill still. <laughs> yeah, she says, it's not safe here. We're leaving now. We can come back tomorrow night. He nods. He's not used to seeing such violence. He sees Torquel. You have a crossbow bolt in you, right? Yes. <clears throat> and he sees you walk up the hill. Or No, no, I think it was a club that got me. Yeah, you got yeah, so you, I, yes, it was a like, club. Like, split across the head, maybe? Or something. He sees you walk yeah. up the hill and sees... Them. Yeah, he's, we're... I mean, he's, it's, he's gonna have a hard time seeing us. We have no light. We're just... You know, he, he, I'm sure he'll see us when we get close enough, but right, we're, yeah. we're, we're being low and, you know, 
his his general impression is like, yeah, good idea. I wasn't expecting this. Let's get the F out. Yeah. And she says, as they move south, she says, we were seen. And I believe they will come looking for us. Unless anybody has anything else to say, I think that's a good place to end it tonight. <laughs> Time for some quail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's what is it? The squirrel is like rat. But un, unhooked for? What is this? <laughs> um, Julius would have a couple of closing words, but nothing too dire. Um, what do you want to say? So Julius would look upon them and. There were some that did escape. Find them. Bring them to me. Alive. For now. Except the rest of these. I think we can leave this as it is, perhaps. I'm sure this happens quite a bit in this part of town. With grave robbing and all that. And we'll nod to Giant's blood and take his leave. Tar Tarbin scowls, very, very unhappy at the idea that someone escaped. Sets off in pursuit. All right, my friends. Good first session. All right. Yep. Okay. Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff.